some background information. When I went through the questions, I kind of categorized them into four categories, and so that's kind of how we'll go through it. We'll go through my background and experience, and several of the questions were more opinion questions for me, so I'll answer those at that time. Uh, we're going to talk about the auditing profession. Um, please ignore any typos that you see. <laughs> um, the profession of how to get into it, what does public accounting look as far as like the different levels of public accounting, what you might do with it, e within each one. Um, we'll talk about the audit process and risk assessment because several questions were geared towards risk assessment. And um, we'll talk about some client interactions, including some fraud that I've run across in my career. And hopefully we have time to get through all that. Um, first of all, I started in public accounting in high school. I actually worked, um, my neighbor was a CPA and he had a sole practitioner's business where he pretty much just did tax returns and he did some compilation financial statements. I worked for him my senior year. Um, I took a bookkeeping class my junior year and loved it in high school. And the bookkeeping teacher kind of changed the course of my life. I was going to go into science because I was good in math and science. And he said, you know, you should think about being a, an accountant and getting your CPA. They can make a lot of money. And I thought, dollar signs, OK. <laughs> I didn't realize it took a while to work your way up to that. <laughs> um, and then I went to your college here at Eastern at that time, transferred to Black Hill State University actually Black Hill State College. Um, it was a rodeo college, and I like to follow the rodeo crowd, I guess. I wasn't a rodeo person myself, but um, dropped out after a couple of years and went to work for Southeast Electric Cooperative in, in my hometown, and um, was an accountant there. Thought, you know, my, my fiance lived there, in the town, and this is just a good way to make a living. I actually made pretty decent money for that time. My, my salary is about 30000 for an electric cooperative. They paid pretty decently. I was bored out of my mind doing the same thing every day. So some of the questions were, what about accounting versus auditing or tax? Well, I did work for a private you know, company, a utility co-op for about two years and couldn't stand it. I was so bored. So then I went back to school to MSU and got my degree. And while I was finishing up school, I went to work for Belt Camp Stanovine and Bateson, which was a local, a fairly large local CPA firm. Um, they had revenues of about $4 million, gross revenues a year. Um, probably about 20 employees, 20 to 25, if I remember correctly. Um, I started in their computer department doing data entry. At that time, um, tax accountants filled out forms by hand and handed them into the computer department. And we did have computers. They were big AS400, you know, beyond that I can't remember. But they were just huge computers where we did data entry, entered the tax returns, printed them. Did that for about a year, and then I moved into their bookkeeping department, did payroll, payroll reports, um, monthly financial statements, um, started doing some tax work. And before I graduated, I was auditing for about a year, just as a staff accountant. And then actually the summer after I graduated, I started in charging my first government audit because I had just taken a government class and nobody else at the firm had government expertise at all, which I couldn't say I did, but uh, the firm did the right thing. They hired some outside experts and I got some excellent training in governments and that's kind of been my specialty since then is government auditing. I do a little bit of everything, um, which I'll talk about here. Uh, I was with Belt Camp until about 1994 and then um, the partner the audit partner and I broke off and started our own firm, Canavan Company. And I um, was a partner with that firm until 2001. And we had just reached the point where we needed to grow, but didn't really have the size that, you know, of staffing that we needed to grow or the resources. And Anderson's or Newland um, bought a small tax practice in Bozeman, Montana. and. Um, 
So I, and I'm, I was very aware of Anderson's or Mullen, and so I merged my practice, my part of the practice, plus my partner, Marjorie Knob, lived at Big Sky, Montana, and didn't want to commute anymore. She actually wanted to start an office at Big Sky, so it worked out best for both of us. And I've been with Belt Camp since 2001. Um, or sorry, I've been with Anderson's or Mullen since 2001. Let's see, Anderson's or Mullen is about a $30 million CPA firm. We're the largest in Montana, um, that's solely in Montana. Ike Bailey is way larger than that if you look at their whole footprint, but, but um, we're solely in Montana at this time. And um, we're listed, I think, we're, we're within the top 200 CPA firms in the nation as far as size is concerned. Um, I do a lot of roles within Anderson's or Mullen. I'm, I was the Bozeman office um, vice chair or vice president, office vice president, which is big managing partner. Um, I co-did that with another shareholder there. Um, I'm a, what I would consider a generalist, which means I do a little bit of everything. And that's not unusual in Montana if you're going to work for a Montana CPA practice. In the larger firms, probably about half of our um, CPAs in Anderson's or Mullen specialize in either tax or auditing or consulting, our consulting practice. And about half of them are what I would consider generalists, where they do tax returns, they do audits, um, do consulting, different levels of consulting. So uh, again, like I said, in Montana, there's not the depth of the market. So, so, you know, in order to stay busy, you, you, um, you can't do government audits year round. You could probably in that industry, but why would you want to? <laughs> but, um, but, you know, the variety is good. Um, I would say it's getting harder and harder to be a generalist because standards are getting um, more and more and more and more um, tax code laws, more regulations over that, more standards and auditing. So it is more difficult to do a little bit of everything. I'm doing less and less tax than I've ever done and focus mostly on auditing. Um, other things, my background besides just where I work is um, I've always been involved with the Montana Society of CPAs. And that's actually how I got to know some partners in Anderson's or Newland and knew that they were a good firm in order to join them. I, I've done a lot of networking through there. I think that um, professional associations help keep you on the, um, you know, at your best and keep challenging you to learn and keep growing with the profession. It's a great networking opportunity, um, pretty much any job that I've gotten, I've gotten through that kind of an organization, just knowing people. Um, I'm also, uh, I started with the State Board of Public Accountants and their professional monitoring, which means in order for a firm or a sole practitioner or, or a CPA to get licensed, they have to send in some of their work to the State Board and a team of us would get together and review that work to make sure it met professional standards so that they could get a license. That was a great networking opportunity and also kept us at, you know, on, on the top of our game as far as standards and authority, um, knowing you know, when you have to write someone up for not doing something right, you really need to be able to research it, know that you're not wrong. You know, I mean, you're affecting their career and so it keeps you at the top of your game. Um, I moved from professional monitoring into peer review once I joined Anderson's or Mullen. And peer review is a program through the AICPA, um, American Institute of CPAs, that where peer firms will come in and do a peer review or like an audit of another firm and issue a report to make sure that their system of quality control is in place so that they know that they're following professional standards and not issuing um, substandard work. Um, so I've been doing peer review since about 2001. Um, currently, I'm the chairman for the peer review committee for, for, um, from the Montana Society of CPAs. So 
So each state, um, not every state, but most of them have their own peer review committee that answers to the AICPA, and, and Montana does have their own. Okay, questions on my background that were submitted. Um, with your current experience and, uh, um, and auditing knowledge, what is something that you wish you would have known when you were a senior in college? Um, well, I suppose the deep answer when I was thinking of this is um, don't be afraid of saying yes to new opportunities. You never know which direction your career is going to take or what path it's going to take. Um, I ended up here in Billings, Montana because we lost the audit partners in our Billings office. And since I was originally from eastern Montana, the firm asked if I would be um, willing or interested to transfer. I probably wouldn't have ever left Bozeman. I built you know, my career, my business development, my, my resources, my clients there um, since 1987. But um, my husband wanted to get closer to home because he likes to hunt back east. And so this was a good compromise. It got us closer to eastern Montana, but not that far from Bozeman. And, and I travel a lot with my clients. They're all over the state, so I can get back to the mountains when I want to. But you never know, as you can see, my path kind of went, you know, and you never know what, where it's going to take you. So um, I would say to a senior, you know, just because you start down one path doesn't mean you're going to be there by the end of your career. It could go a lot of different ways. And don't be afraid to say yes. Um, you know, probably more like the undeep answer would be, I had no idea how you were going to take the theory that I was learning and apply it practically in an audit situation for auditing in particular. Um, and when we talk about the audit process and some of the handouts I gave you, what I didn't know is that there's quality control material services that you buy as a firm. And those services, are, um, they've been peer reviewed to make sure that all of their <coughs> products meet professional standards. And so what that provides to us is checklists on how to, how to audit cash, checklists on how to do risk assessment, checklists on how to calculate planning materiality. Um, you know, so it's pretty hands, you know, user friendly and you follow the checklists and if you follow them and, um, you know, not skip over steps, you're going to end the product that meets professional standards. So I had no clue of that. I just, how, how am I going to take what this means and apply it? Well, there's a lot of services out there to help you. Um, one of the, we use a service called PPC from Thomson Reuter Company. Um, that's the largest product for quality control materials across the nation. So if you write down PPC, if you end up going into public accounting, nine times out of 10, that will be the service that you will see. I started off with it in Belt Camp Santa Monica Bateson and used it in my own company. And um, when I first joined Anderson's or Mueller, they were actually using a McLadry product. It was horrible. And um, I actually advocated for them to go to PPC and they've gone back to PPC so for the last several years. What made me choose auditing over other fields? Um, probably number one was a strong mentor, which was, I mentioned her, Marjorie Knob. She was an audit partner with Belt Camp Stand by and Bateson. She started her career here in Billings with KPMG. It was actually Pete Marwick at the time that she worked for them. Um, they had given her excellent audit training, you know, big four, then it was big eight national firm. Um, and so she was a strong advocate and mentor for me and because I clicked with her and I clicked with her training methods, I just um, connected more with auditing than with the tax partners who, um, sorry we're a room for a full of women, but, but there were not very many women in the profession at that time and the tax partners were pretty much old school, kind of chauvinistic, and so I really just connected with her more at that time. And that's kind of how I started down auditing. Um, again, like I said, I did everything pretty much, a little bit of everything, but um, growth opportunities took me more into audit because 
government auditing um, was changing at that time, right about the time I started or graduated. Um, until then, the state of Montana actually audited all of the governments in Montana, and they had a division of you'd go to work for them as a government auditor and you'd audit all the local governments. In about 1987, I think, or 88, they started um, uh, privatizing that and then started doing what they call third-party contracts where they would, the state still manages the process, but they basically, the local government hires an independent CPA firm to do the audit. Well, there was a lot of audits at that time in government, and that was kind of where I got started. So, so it was a you know I, kind of a specialty that I grew and um, helped me stay more in auditing. Um, I always liked auditing more, but I did like the variety because if you if you think about the two, those two uh, specialties, tax versus auditing, tax returns you're cranking out a lot of projects in a short period of time. You know, basically January through April 15th, you know, a lot of the tax returns might take you one to two hours. Some of the bigger ones could take you 10 to eight, 10 to 15 hours to do, depending on those, but you're cranking out a lot. You're just plowing through it. And then by the time you get done with tax season, you're so sick of that pile like this on your desk. And then audits, take longer, there's more to them. They might range anywhere from 80 hours to about 400 hours. So you can take a little bit more time. I mean, you're on a budget, you can't waste time, but you, you can dig into a little bit more depth if you have to on that client, and you can, um, you know, you don't have to worry about 15 projects you have to get done in one, one day or one week, you can have two months to get this project done. And so it was just kind of a nice balancing variety. Um, but like I said, I do less and less tax now. If I've done accounting, would I rather do auditing? Auditing, absolutely. I actually really enjoy accounting. I mean, like some of my tax clients, if they've got an issue and I can get in there and help them clean up their bank reconciliation or help them post this kind of unusual journal entry. That's, that's a challenge, it's a puzzle that I really enjoy. I couldn't do it on a day-by-day -day basis. Um, first of all, in public accounting, we do have what we call controller services division. Some of them calling their bookkeeping department, their payroll department, we do that, those kinds of services for clients. Um, but those are usually not CPAs, and even if they are, um, your, the pay is less in those departments because um, we can't charge as much for those services to the client. So um, that is a perfect fit for some people and a perfect fit for paraprofessionals or those that have their accounting degree but didn't want to go on and get further certification as their CPA or something. Um, but it, it just it wasn't for me. I was fairly ambitious and wanted to own the company at some point. So, so um, I, and, I, and that wouldn't be as boring because you're doing that work for a real variety of clients um, instead of just doing the same thing. At Southeast Electric, it was the same thing for the client day after day, month after month. So, um, so that wouldn't be as boring, but overall I like auditing way more. Did you start out on the accounting bookkeeping side and then move to auditing? And yes, I did, as I've answered already. Describe your average work day. Um, and this one, I'll talk about what an average day later on would be for a new staff accountant, but for me, it's meeting, 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 meeting. Um, so I might spend six hours of the day in meetings sometimes, sometimes more. Um, you know, within, once you become a shareholder, you move up into leadership in a public accounting firm. You know, there's a lot besides handling your clients, there's staff recruiting and retention committees that you have to be on. And I'm on Anderson's or Mulan staff recruiting. Um, I'm in the business unit of a test, which is audit, and so there's a test meetings of, you know, 
how do we apply this new standard? How do we teach the staff this new standard? You know, there's weekly meetings on the attest unit. Um, there's office vice president. I, I'm now the office vice president of the billings office, and so there's firm-wide meetings of the office vice presidents of are we running these offices to the best of our ability. Um, so, and then there's the client meetings, which un unfortunately for me right now seem to be less and less, and there's more what I would call administration or management of the firm type meetings. Lots of phone calls. Um, I'm on email all day long. I'm on email all night long. Um, you need, you know, that needs to be managed. It can overwhelm your life if you let it. You have to shut off your phone at some point in time. But, but the advantage of that is if I want to run to my son's event or whatever, then I still can be kind of in contact if an emergency occurred. Um, I do a lot of researching of authority and helping staff apply that. So, for example, right now, um, I don't know if you've had a government class, but there's the new pension standards that have been issued by CASB. This is the year that they apply. So, there's a ton of research on how to apply that. Um, so, I um, do a lot of research when issues arise in the middle of an audit, so I spend a lot of time researching and helping staff. Um, business development is a huge part of a public accounting practice. You have to build those clients. You have to get new clients. Every year, CPA firms lose an average of about 10% of their clients, and it can be through death. It can be through mergers and acquisitions. They, you know, your client sells to another who has their own CPA. So you, to grow, you have to at least increase your business 10% plus an additional amount. So there's a lot of business development activities that we do. And then at Andersons or Mullen in particular, but I think most CPA firms are this way. There's a lot of community involvement. We try to give back to the communities that we belong in. So that's kind of my days. Um, how challenging would you rate your job? I say 10, um, but it's not brain surgery or creating a cure for cancer. Uh, 10, I would say it's, it's challenging because there's new standards every day, new, new FASBs, new GASBs, new auditing standards, new government auditing standards, new tax code rules and regu regulations. Um, right now, the CPA profession is under a lot of pressure from regulatory agencies, in particular the Department of Labor, um, just like um, public company audits became regulated under the PCAOB. There's pressure to regulate even um, you know, non-public company audits. And so there's a lot of stress and challenges involved with that, holding, holding the government at bay. I think challenges grow as you move up in your career. Um, for a new staff person, the challenges will be how to learn and apply the standards and what you're doing, um, completing your work within budget, that can be a challenge um, for staff, and then meeting client deadlines is a challenge. So I say 10, but like I said, it's not because I'm doing brain surgery, it's not life or death, um, but it's challenging, and frankly, that's one of the reasons I love it, because I get easily bored, like I said before, and I'm learning something new every day, and I'm I actually really like that. It's a good puzzle. I like to make the puzzles work. So, <laughs> um, what is the average number of audits you work on in a typical week, month, or year? There really is no typical answer for that. Right now, I have 19 audits that I'm working on. So, quite a few juggle. This is my busiest time of year um, because all the governments in Montana are a June 30 fiscal year in. So they have to have their audits done by December 31st. So I've got all the government audits going on right now. There's a lot of nonprofit organizations that have a June 30 year in, and so they need to have their audits done by June or by December 31st. Um, and then we have a group of auditors that work more on for profits or other nonprofit organizations that have a calendar year in. So their busiest time of the year would be basically during tax season. Um,
I also serve as the technical partner on any government and single audit, so I have 19 going on now, but across the firm, we probably have 40, maybe, um, government and single audits going on, so I'm answering questions constantly from other staff outside of the audits that are mine that I'm working on. Um, average, I bet, probably about six to 10 audits going on at once. I have excellent, strong managers and supervisors and in-charge staff that are doing the work on those and communicating with me, keeping me up in the loop. So um, it's not me out there working on 19 audits. I, I do review, I answer questions, I review at the end to make sure everything's done correctly. I do technical quality control review for other offices and other um, CPAs in our firm. but. Um, I have excellent staff that are really keeping the balls up in the air for me. I total probably around 100 audits a year. Um, we also do a lot of compilations, reviews, and agreed upon procedures, which all fall under the attest department, so I manage a lot of those engagements at the same time or, or have clients under those. What do I find the most challenging? I think I've already talked about that. The regulatory pressures um, and standard changes, new, new standards being adopted. What is the most difficult part of your job? Uh, well, for staff, a new staff, I would say technology challenges, and we'll talk about that a little bit, and um, can be very frustrating and challenging at times. I'll, I'll tell you why here in a little bit. For me, it, um, and for staff, it's clients not meeting their expectations. Um, we really try to have very open and um, good communication with clients of saying, this is what we need from you and this is the timeline we need it for scheduling purposes to know which team is going out when. Well, when they don't meet those expectations and don't get, you know, then you've got whole teams that you're rescheduling or transferring to a different job or so that can be very difficult. Um, what we call scope creep, which is we bid on an audit, agree to a fee for these certain services, well then th they come back to you and they're not gonna do this schedule that, you, that they committed that they were gonna do or they are not gonna provide this for you. So then you have to do it. Well that's creeped into what you have agreed to for pricing. So then you have to go into negotiation on pricing. That can be very difficult. That's more at the manager and above level. Staff wouldn't really be. They should be aware of when they're moving into that and communicate that up to their supervisor, but they don't have to deal with that. Um, difficult is not having enough hours in the day. All right, any questions on that? My background opinions on that. I'm going pretty fast. If it's just blurring, well, hopefully you'll take something out. <laughs> the auditing profession is a key player in the financial structure and stability of the world economy. And sometimes we don't really think of that when we're doing an audit in Billings, Montana for a little mom and pop grocery store or something. How does that affect the world economy? But as auditors, we provide trusted assurance to the stakeholders. And there's a variety of stakeholders. And that mom and pop shop, they probably were required to have an audit because of a banking arrangement that they have. And so that bank, in order to be able to trust, to give them the money, you know, loan them the money, they need to trust the financial statements. And so we provide that assurance. So there's an exchange of capital in order to run those businesses. That adds to the um, gross snatch. The G what, what I can't see. Yes, very good. <laughs> you know, so even at that level, we actually are helping to run the world economy. The audit is essential to the credibility of accounting and financial reporting for public and private entities. Um, auditors hold governments and nonprofits accountable to the taxpayers and the donors. So there's a lot of different stakeholders involved in auditing. Um, one question, and I don't know if I really answer it later on, I can't remember, is um, Anderson's or Mullen is not registered to do any work for public companies. So we don't do any public company auditing. We do do some consulting um, 
services for some public companies. Um, we have done some SOX 404 internal audit work for them. We can become part of their management structure, but we are not registered to audit them. We chose, we were registered at the very beginning of the PCAOB changeover. We went through one PCAOB inspection. We, we passed it, but it was a very difficult thing to go through. For one client, it just did not make economic sense. There's not many public companies in Montana, and if they are here, they're pretty much covered by the big four, KPMG, um, Deloitte, or the, the next level, the large regional firms, Moss Adams, Grant Thornton, some of those larger CPA firms. So we weren't really going to be able to expand into that area, and so therefore we chose to get out of the public company arena. But there's still a lot of stakeholders for private companies. Um, I think I talk about here, maybe I don't, but um, the reasons a private company would need an audit usually is banking arrangements. We do a lot of construction audits because construction companies need bonded in order for the bond insurance company to give them an insurance product. They want to make sure that they're able to estimate correctly, um, to estimate their percentage of completion, and that their financial statements are accurate. So we do a lot of construction company audits. Um, depending on their level, sometimes they will allow for a review, so we do a lot of reviews also for construction companies, but the larger ones require an audit. Um, sometimes there's a, an absent owner arrangement, and so they're, the company is run by management and the owner chooses to have an audit just for their comfort level. Um, those are pretty much the types of private company audits we do um, in Montana. And then our, our largest niche at Anderson's or Mulan is nonprofit organizations. Um, a lot of times their bylaws will require an audit, just, just the, um, they want to be able to give assurance to their donors that they're spending the money in, in accordance with how the donor wants it spent. And then if they have federal money coming into the nonprofit, there's federal laws that require them to have an audit. So we do a lot of nonprofit auditing. And then government auditing is our next largest. Audit purpose. The purpose is to provide financial statement users with an opinion by the auditor on whether the financial statements are presented fairly in all material respects in accordance with the applicable financial reporting framework. Um, I guess another thing I didn't really realize in school was that all not everyone used GAAP accounting when they do their books. Um, in Montana, there's a lot of income tax basis accounting. We've even done some audits on the income tax basis of accounting. Um, there's some cash basis, but I have never done an audit of a cash basis financial statement. Um, those are usually compilations that are done along with a tax return to provide to a bank or something when they don't require an audit or a review. Um, but income tax basis probably is the most prevalent for um, those that are just getting compilations and some reviews. And I have done one audit, one or two audits in my career on the income tax basis of accounting. Most audits are done on the GAAP basis. Not done on the but the financial statements are prepared on the GAAP basis of accounting. An audit consists of third-party verification of the elements of the financial statements of a legal entity. So that's the audit profession. What are the opportunities for auditors in Montana? Um, our president of our firm just came back in the last month and a half from two very large managing partner meetings and where um, through different organizations, the managing partners that belong to that organization get together and they talk about the state of the profession, state of their firms, etc. And the number one issue, the number one concern was um, recruiting and retaining staff. The demographic is such that we've got, um, the percent is astronomical of retiring shareholders and auditors leaving the profession and not as many students coming into the profession. So 
it's a seller's market, you being the seller. I think there's huge opportunity for you in public accounting and in auditing in particular. Um, in Montana and across the nation. Um, just some statistics, I can only speak for Andersons or Newland, um, but my guess is this would translate pretty well to like an I. Bailey or a Whipfley, which was the old Galusha, Higgins and Galusha. Um, but last year, Anderson Zermulin, Zermulin hired 15 to 20 interns last year. Um, three interns out of six from our Billings office got full-time offers or, and are working full-time. Two in our Billings office and one in our Great Falls office. Um, we, on average, I would say, well, last year we, did, we hired 10 to 15 new hires right out of college. Um, and six to eight on average. So it kind of goes in cycles a little bit if you think about it because um, public accounting isn't for everybody and it's about your third to fourth year that that might kind of solidify for some staff. And so, you know, you, we might do a big hire. 10 to 15 was a big year for us to hire a new, and this is across our offices. We have seven offices. Um, so then next year, my guess is it'll be a little bit lower back down to probably the six to eight of new hires. And then depending on growth and, um, and what we've lost. Um, we have, we're way better than the national average on retaining staff, but still, I think our numbers are, I think Nash, oh, I should have looked that up, but I've seen it. I think nationally turnover is, to 15 percent do you know Mike? I don't know. No. I, I think it's somewhere there and AZ is about <laughs> five to six percent so we're quite a bit lower than the national average but um, it's, it still happens not everybody wants to stay in the profession. Um, usually the the firms like us are not what the big four if you've heard of up or out where you continually have to be progressing up in your career or you're let go. Um, we have more opportunities for placing you where your strengths lie and, and um, not everybody has to become a shareholder in Anderson's or Newland. We just wouldn't be large enough to be able to accommodate that. So, so that probably is one of the reasons that our, that our turnover is less than national. But I think that's probably pretty common in all Montana firms. Smaller firms do less auditing than larger firms. Um, auditing is not easy as far as keeping up with the standards. Um, we are audited by other firms and have to pass that. We are, our product is turned into government regulators and we have to meet their standards. And so smaller firms over the last several years, a lot of them have gotten out of auditing. Now, in Billings, I know of a couple pretty small firms that still do some nonprofit auditing. So there are a few, um, but usually sole practitioners and even you know offices of 10 people, they're probably more primarily tax. And then they probably do financial statement compilations, maybe some reviews. Um, some bookkeeping and payroll and that kind of stuff. But, you know, so if you're interested in smaller firms, it's less likely it would be in auditing, it would be in one of those other um, specialties. But, so how is it, how sh can you get into the profession if you're interested in it? And um, the number one best way for Andersons or Newland is to apply for and get an internship. Um, we do a lot of interns, across, you know, 15 last year across, across the firm. Um, Billings always does at least two tax interns in the spring and what we call three um, admin interns in the spring during tax season. Um, we do work with your audit schedule to be able to accommodate that at that time of the year. Um, we are, this summer we're hiring a summer intern and that would be more in auditing. Billings has typically not done as many audit internships, but, um, but my goal is to increase that and start doing more here. Um, Bozeman being in a university town, they do two fall, which are typically audit interns and two spring 
two to three in the spring for tax, and I, they might, nope, they don't have a summer intern. Missoula does the same, they do two fall and two spring, you know, so it varies, but, and we hire most of our new hires out of that internship program, so it's really a courtship. You're checking us out, is this the company I'd like to work for, are these the people I want to spend a great deal of my life with, um, and we're checking you out, what's your work ethic like, what's your attitude. We don't expect you to be able to know how to do everything in an internship. It's more about attitude and your effort um, and what I would call your soft skills. But it's, it's a good, you know, that's where we hire most of our um, staff is out of an internship. And I would say that's probably also true for Ike Bailey and Galusha, but I don't know that for certain. Um, we have gotten resumes off the cuff and been very impressed and hired you know, without an internship, but if you can fit one in, I think that's the absolute best way to do it. If you're interested in staying in Montana, um, if you have a bookkeeping job of any kind, if, you, if you've got a homeowners association and you volunteer to do the bookkeeping for that, or you belong to a club organization of some kind or a fraternity um, and you do the bookkeeping for that, or if you can get the companies, that's probably one of the number one hires or people trying to look, find bookkeepers out there to do, to do their bank reconciliations and print their checks, post their payables, etc. cetera. Um, so bookkeeping jobs, unfortunately, they might not pay as much as maybe even like waiting tables or something with tips, but that is an excellent thing to put on your resume to get hired if you're interested in the profession. Uh, networking opportunities are also an excellent way to make connections. I know, um, join the accounting club if you can. I know it's a little bit more difficult. Um, MSUB is what I would, you know, I don't know if this is the right term, but it's a working college. There's a lot of students that are out there working, having jobs at the same time, and that's not unheard of in university towns either, but it's probably more so here than others. So I know it's difficult, but if you can get into those organizations, there was a panel of CPAs, I know last year, that came to an accounting club meeting here. I was on the panel at night just talking about our organization. I can't remember what all the questions were. Um, I think three or four people showed up. It was unfortunate because those are good opportunities to get to know someone that can get your foot in the door to get a job if you're interested. Um, and it looks good on a resume, if nothing else. The M Montana State Society of CPAs has a student membership. I think it's fairly cheap, like $25 or $35. Um, they might even have scholarships available to pay for that student membership. I think it's free. Is it free? Okay, excellent. So I think that's, I mean, as, as you've seen, that's been one of the ways that I've met people throughout my career and, and, and made changes and just have really helped and mentored me along the way. Um, so that is an excellent, you know, they've got good newsletters of what's going on. They have job advertisements. Um, it's just an excellent resource for, you know, future CPAs. Student day. I think the Billings chapter puts on a student day and you go around to the firms. That's very important too. Um, I, I think there was pretty low turnout this year I've heard on that. So um, these are all ways to help get your foot in the door on a career public accounting. Um, starting your career. Small firms, like I said, do primarily tax accounting and compilation review services. At Anderson's or Mulan, we hire you usually in one, one business unit, so you're either hired in a test or hired in tax, but your first three years of your career, you would do a little bit of everything. Um, it's just that the, the auditors need staff and so they get the hire that year, for example, or tax needs staff and they hope that that is the, the specialization that you'll keep growing your career in. But we've had people switch back and forth, not back and forth, but you know, been hired by audit and ended up going, oh, tax is really where I feel my skills fit the best. And your coach and mentor can help guide you, that, you know, in that direction. Um, so in a small firm, you'll do everything, probably. In a larger firm our size, there are some 
that will just do auditing, but for the first three years, we try to have you do everything. You can't be a well-rounded consultant unless you know a little bit about a per, you know, a client's business, and that includes tax, audit, accounting, payroll even. A lot of CPAs continue to be generalists. I talked about that. Um, get your CPA. If you want to be in public accounting, you have to have your CPA. Um, we hire without it, of course, and you can even get promoted up to the senior level without your CPA, but um, we don't promote beyond the senior level unless you have your CPA, unless you choose to move into like the accounting services division, controller services division. And I think we do have a few tax people that don't have their CPA, but they can't sign tax returns. So you can only go up to a certain level. If you can't start managing and running that client, um, we can't promote you further or really increase your pay that much beyond cost of living adjustment. So, so you are putting a ceiling on yourself if you don't get your CPA if you want to be in a public accounting firm. I would highly encourage you, no matter what you want to do, you might end up owning a hula hoop business in 20 years. Your CPA will help you get wherever you want to go. It's something you'll never, um, I mean, you can always be proud of that designation and it'll help you no matter what you do in life. So uh, you've, you've worked so hard in school to get through that degree, take the extra effort and get your CPA. I highly encourage you to. The most important skills for starting auditor, um, and these are kind of rote or, um, but you know, basic technical knowledge of the accounting principles and professional and auditing standards. Basically, what you would get in a four-year degree, um, we expect you to have those under your belt. Not that you can sit there and quote them. I couldn't sit there and quote them. But that you know where to go look them up, um, that you know the basics, basically, by the time you get out of school. Technology skills are huge. Technology, we, we are 100% paperless in audit. Um, everything is electronic. Everything is through technology. We're, we're heading towards 100% paperless and tax. Mostly there, I would say. A few of our older CPAs who will be retiring in the next few years Maybe you're a little old school there, but the firm policies are paperless. Um, we actually are on a, what we, is a virtual desktop infrastructure where as long as we have an internet connection, we can um, log into our, um, our own desktop computer anywhere in the world. And it's just like what you see when you're at the office. Um, we're encouraging remote access and work um, from home if that fits in better. From wherever. So technology is huge. Right out of school, play with Word, play with Excel, play with Adobe as much as you can. Excel you're going to use every hour of every day until you get to probably a senior or supervisor or manager level and then you're probably still using it. QuickBooks is a plus in Montana. Um, the majority of our small business owners and nonprofits use QuickBooks. If you can get some kind of familiarity with that from day one out on the audit, it's going to help you because you can then access that database. You can it can help you with your inquiries. If your senior supervisor, soup managers having to do it for you, that's going to slow you down. That being said, not every student is going to have it. Um, but if you can get access through that somehow, through a bookkeeping job that you've got, or, um, or even if it's Quicken or another software where you just get familiar and can play with it, that'll translate to QuickBooks pretty quickly. QuickBooks is pretty user friendly and easy, but um, the majority in Montana use it. And so that's going to help your career. If I see QuickBooks use on a resume, it perks me up a little bit in the hiring process. Overall, you just be able, must be able to learn software fairly quickly. I mean, it's all software related anymore, so. Understanding bookkeeping and the reconciliation process. I've made hires that 
didn't really know how to do a bank reconciliation. And I know they've had it. It's probably in Principles 101, maybe in high school bookkeeping. Reconcile your own personal checking account, please, so that you just get experience. Um, if you're going to audit it, you have to understand the process, and you have to be able to understand how to help clients or how to propose an audit adjustment. Um, we're not there to clean up their books, but if they're wrong, we have to propose what their correct adjustment would be. You have to understand bookkeeping. Good communication and writing skills. Um, good work ethic and willingness to learn. Um, presentation of skills are a plus, especially if you want to move into leadership. Um, you have to be able to present the audit report to the board at at least probably the manager level, if not, and if you're good, we probably would encourage you to start doing it at the senior supervisor level, um, which would mean incentive pay or bonuses if you can step up faster than the norm. Um, not all of our CPAs, that's not a strength for everyone. We still have some of your typical, you know, stereotypes of a lot of shy people who are excellent at getting the work done, um, but to move up in auditing, I have two managers on staff right now, wonderful, wonderful, excellent technicians, managers. Um, one is going to go to shareholder because she can do presentations for me, and the other one is too nervous or shy to do them, and she's probably kind of stuck at the manager level. So. If you want to move up in the career, that's the same for tax. You don't do really presentations necessarily in tax, unless you're good at it and love to do it for clients and for business development purposes. But you're always interacting, talking to the clients. So you need to be able to not think you're going to be in a cubicle in the back room somewhere. You need to be able to, you know. I, I am a shy person. Um, I'm an introvert. When I go home tonight, I'll be like, don't talk to me, Brad. I did four presentations today, my husband, you know. But you just have to be able to stretch outside your comfort zone and, and do it to grow up as a leader in the profession. Analytical ability and judgment. That's the one that is, how do I explain that to people? Well, it's really taking the theory and, and figuring out how to apply it practically. And that doesn't come overnight. We don't expect, we expect a little bit of it off the get-go, like, okay, this bank reconciliation looks a little bit different than the one on the first job I worked on, but okay, it still has, here's the bank balance, here's the outstanding deposit, you know, just the ability to kind of think through and figure things out. That grows and grows over time with experience, so it's nothing, you know, we say you've got to be able to figure it all out on day one, absolutely not. Um, but um, there is a project at the AICPA called Enhancing Audit Quality, and that project is a direct response from the Department of Labor coming down on the profession saying we're doing crap audits. I mean, we've actually gone down on our um, audit quality because they do um, they do random samples of our audit work and have found that over time we've actually gotten worse on our non-conforming substandard audits. And so in response to that, one of the things that the AICPA is looking at is, first of all, education at the high school level, um, education at the college level, and the CPA exam, and somehow changing the CPA exam to be able to measure or judge analytical ability and judgment. I'm not quite sure how they get there, um, thank God I'm not on any of that kind of committees or anything, but also be aware, I guess, where you're at, um, probably seniors at the 400 level uh, get the exam done before they make changes here. You know? <laughs> Careers and, career steps in public accounting. You start off as a staff accountant. Um, that's probably about one to three years, depending on how quick you learn, um, your experience, maturity level. Um, you must pass the CPA exam. Well, that's not true. I should have moved that down. To go any higher than a senior, you have to pass the CPA exam. Starting salary at Anderson's or Newland is 42940 That's for 2,200 hours. 
A regular work year is 2080, so we require 120 hours of overtime, and that overtime time and a half is built into that salary of 42.9. Senior is anywhere from three to six years um, of your career. Your starting sal your average salary is about 47 to 52 right now. A supervisor is six to eight years. Um, that's 55 to 61,000 manager level to senior manager, 18 to 5, 8 to 15 years, um, 64 to 82, and then the partner level really depends, and that's why this is a huge range right here, 8 to 15 years. For a lot of firms, it depends on when there's an opening. I mean, in Montana, a firm is only going to grow to a certain size. Um, you can. You can do mergers and acquisitions, with An which Andersons or Newland has done to grow. Um, organic growth, which is where each CPA is building their own practice, getting new clients. That's pretty s slow growth in Montana. There's just limited industries, limited clients. Um, so kind of the partner might depend. You've got to have the skills and get there. Then you might be on a holding pattern for a few years until there's a spot opening. or um, you know, growth has occurred where there's room at that level. Any questions on that? Do, does Anderson's or Mulan uh, offer any incentives to pass the CPA exam? Do they we do. Any? You know what, and I couldn't quote you those um, exact dollar amounts, but, but there's a bonus, and the bonus um, is the largest, I think it's 2,000, two or 3,000, if you pass it within 12 months, and then if you pass it within 18 months, that bonus amount goes down. And then I think after two years, officially the bonus goes away. But um, if there's circumstances, we've got one gentleman now that has one left to pass, and he's just over the time, but we've said he's a super employee. He's going to be a shareholder someday if he sticks with it. Um, it's just he hasn't, hadn't made the CPA his priority you know, early enough. Um, it's hard, a lot of times you get out of school and you want to start playing and it's, you know, you want to golf. He wanted to golf, that was his thing basically. Um, but when you start work, there's a lot of hours in the day that you're working, it's hard to find the time. So the sooner you can get it done, life gets in the way, marriages, kids, everything. Um, the sooner you can get it done, the better. But there are incentives and I think that's probably true for most firms especially the larger I, Bailey, Volusia type firms, some incentives on passing. There's also some reimbursement for the cost of the exams and some materials that you can buy. Um, those are good questions to ask in a recruiting event if you show up. The recruiter should know I'm a recruiter, but I don't know specifics. I'll have to learn those for next time. If you keep saying shareholder, that's a partner, right? Partner, shareholder. If, if the firm is a corporation, you're considered a shareholder. You own the stock in the company. If it's a partnership or an LLC, which a lot of them are, then you're considered a partner. Like that, the major. Yep. Good question. Um, so of the handouts, not not the um, exam one, but the or the PowerPoint one, but the other one um, on the first page, nine through ten, and I just hand wrote numbers here in the corner. That is um, core competencies needed in each area and how you would move up from a staff to a partner or shareholder level. Um, this has not been adopted by Anderson's or Mullen yet. Um, this actually came from BDO. We're a member of what's called a BDO Alliance. BDO is the fifth largest CPA firm in the world. And they have a, an alliance of smaller CPA firms that join them. Um, we have access to all their resources. Um, we pay a large fee to be, belong to their alliance. But for us, it's a way to get some, you know, those big firms have all the players and who's setting standards and who's, you know, and so it's a way for us to access those types of resources, but keeping our independence and being our own um, private company here in Montana. But anyway, this comes from BDO and then we're adopting it. We're actually just working through the process now, but what we want to be able to do, and why I provided it to you, is it's just kind of nice to know, well, what do I need to know or do to move from a staff one to a staff two, 
and on up. And this lays it out, you know, on client service, what would be the expectations, on business development, communication, leadership, um, operations, and then it goes into tax, CSD, which is the controller services and a test. That's just for your information. If you want to read through it, just because you're curious, it's there for you. And then on page 10, right behind that, I gave you an Anderson's Renewal and Benefit Summary form, just so you kind of know what kind of benefits are available in a public accounting firm. These are probably pretty close to what an IED or a Volusia would offer y'all. So health coverage, life insurance, long-term disability. We actually have a short-term disability policy we implemented this last year, which would be for maternity leave and those kinds of things. Um, you do have to pay for it, but it's, since it's a group policy, it's pretty cheap. Um, that is available. It would run pre-tax, so um, holidays that are off, um, half day Fridays. This is probably just Anderson's or Mulan from um, Memorial Day through Labor Day. You get half day Friday um, paid off. So uh, we did a benefit survey, survey and of all of our benefits, including health insurance, everyone said don't take half day Fridays away. What's well, the most beautiful time in Montana in a lot of ways and, and it just kind of helps with work life balance a little bit. Okay, questions, do you think auditing is more difficult than accounting? Um, I do, just because auditing has to build on accounting, you really have to understand all the accounting principles in order to audit them. Um, travel can be an element of auditing, there's firms that the staff travel all the time, um, Andersons or Mulan. Some of our offices travel more than others. Um, in billings, we probably travel closer to 10, per, 10 to 15 percent of the time. We don't travel as much. Billings is bigger, a um, lot more business. We have more audits here locally. So um, we do travel. We are run as across the firm a unit. So um, if I've got someone with a specialty in, say, financial institutions, they might go to Helena to help with a financial institution audit. But again, like I said, in my, in, uh, you know, maybe, I don't know, the average might be 20 to 30 percent of times travel for Andersons or Mulan. There's firms that I say they travel almost 100 percent of the time on audits. So you, that's good questions to ask if you're interviewing. Are auditors in great demand in the state of Montana? Um, where businesses are smaller and um, not publicly traded. And, and I, I think I've answered that. Um, the bigger four firms come in and do most of the publicly traded company audits, um, but there's a lot of audits in nonprofit government and private companies also. What is the relationship between auditing and forensic accounting? There was a lot of questions on forensic accounting and fraud examining. I'm neither, so I can't answer a lot. Um, I do have a couple slides on um, what we do at Anderson's or Mulan as certified fraud examiners. But, um, you know, I thought that probably the relationship, you would start as an auditor and then after several years of experience, you would obtain your CFE, but when I was kind of doing some Google research on forensic accounting and, and CFEs, I see there's several colleges that actually offer forensic accounting degrees. Um, I'm not sure how useful that would be right out of college because, I mean, I think of the FBI or, or uh, city government that hires I mean, they're going to want some experience, I would think. Maybe it's a good way to start. And, you you know, really you can get your CPA exam with any type of degree if you can study and pass a CPA exam. I mean, I have, we hired an astrophysicist that got her CPA, you know, here a couple months ago. <laughs> so, um, so I, I, I can tell you across Montana, I'm not of any, aware of anyone with a, forensic degree um, and our, we have probably five or six or seven now maybe C 
CFEs and they all started as auditors. One actually has been a tax her whole career and she got her CFE because there's a lot of tax issues with fraud too. So, In regards to the auditing profession, what is the most difficult part of being an auditor? Client issues basically, I think. Um, what time of year is busier? For me, the fall is the busiest, but like I said, spring can be pretty busy. Is it difficult to specialize once you, in auditing once you have your CPA license? Um, no, you, start, you can start off auditing on day one. Um, audits are always in a team. Um, usually, you know, it depends on the size of the audit, but you would never, as a new staff, go out and do an audit on your own in Anderson's or Newland anyway. Um, it would always at least be an in charge and a staff person. We try to leverage our jobs, it's called, which means the, the correct ratio of brand new staff to seniors to supervisors, managers, and then an engagement partner. How often does time factor come into play in the cost? Um, versus effectively processing the data, where does the split come to make an opinion statement? Um, well, you know, the correct answer is time never plays. You have to meet all professional standards at all time. You have to issue um, a professional, a, a product that meets all professional standards. That being said, we do budget for what it will take to get a job completed. And that's based on experience. Sometimes we budget incorrectly. Um, sometimes um, the client, something in the client changes and therefore the budget changes. Um, but if you reach the end of your budget and you're not done and you can't feel comfortable giving an opinion, you keep going regardless of the cost. If you're in a quality firm that's going to do quality work. How do you feel auditing is different from real life application? Um, one thing that's, you know, you, you work on a huge variety of clients, so you might be assigned to cash your first year on every audit that you go on. Well, that's gonna look different for every single client you go on because of their industry, how they do it, what software they use, what types of transactions they're processing. So um, that's different from when you get one case study on one client, I mean, you're going to have to apply that over and over and over to a huge variety. Um, moving from one client to the next is, can be difficult. I wasn't, again, like I said, I wasn't aware that there was quality control materials to help perform the engagement when I was in college. Audit process. So this is what it would probably look like on your first um, few audit jobs is for new staff you'd be required to read the prior year's financial statements in preparation for the audit. Um, you would attend the planning and fraud brainstorming meeting. Um, that would include should include staff all the way up to partner um, where you're you're talking through the planning, you're talking through the risk assessment, you're talking through the materiality of that job. Um, you're brainstorming where could fraud occur, where could the you know risk be in this jo job, um, and you will attend that um, over time. Hopefully, you'll be able to participate more in that. Um, you'll per perform substantive audit procedures. Um, cash is the number one thing you'll get to see your first year. Um, and I did, if you look on page 11 through 13 of your handout. I gave you what the cash audit program looks like out of PPC. Um, basically, if you look down the left-hand side of the audit program, if you see that EOC, ROV, those are your assertions that would that procedure would cover. So basically, if you obtain a bank reconciliation for the significant bank accounts, that's going to cover existence, that's going to cover completeness, that's going to cover rights and obligations, valuation, accuracy and classification, and cutoff. Um, so if you just walk down the program and do every step it says, you're going to have a complete audit over cash. 
We tailor these programs depending on our risk assessment. So if we've assessed the risk of material misstatement, RMM is low for cash. Um, for all assertions, we'll probably tailor it down to a pretty basic program and remove some of these steps here. This is just, you know, a full, full program there. Um, you might get to see investments if the investments aren't very complicated. We have some clients with um, endowment funds for nonprofits or ERISA clients with huge investments for pension plans where investments can be awfully complicated and would, that would move up to a higher level, but um, fixed assets is a regular program that new staff would audit fixed assets. Expense and accounts payable testing. You'd probably be asked to update letters and reports from the templates that are provided by your quality control materials. So your management rep letter that's required, there's a template that we go out to, and a lot of times we'll assign new staff because you're pulling up the template and you're making sure, you know, all changes are included in your um, management rep letter. You might be asked to do internal control walkthrough procedures. Um, updating and gaining an understanding of internal controls sometimes are assigned to new staff, but I really think that's too complicated right away. But once those processes are documented, to go walk through a procedure of getting the source document from this particular client and making sure that this person approved it, staff could do that part of it pretty easily. So you might do internal control walkthroughs. And you'll definitely be on inventory observations and counts. Any questions on that? Risk assessment. I'm going to go pretty fast here because I have to leave in about seven minutes, but um, risk assessment, there was a lot of questions that were sent in on risk assessment, which would not be done at the new staff level by any means. You kind of have to have a basic theory of what it means, and you'll learn that, especially through the planning meetings, through, I mean, all of our audit work goes back to the risk assessment, so you'll become very familiar with what is our risk of material misstatement for rights and obligations for accounts payable. Um, but you'll gain an understanding, how we do risk assessment is we gain an understanding of the client and industry and I provided you, again, there's a checklist to gain that understanding um, and that's on page 14 of your handout. So you'll see what some of the questions are on there. Um, I've also, on page 17 of your handout, I provided a list. The service even holds our hand and says, here are some particular entity risk factors that might apply to this client. So you can read through that to see, oh yeah, okay, just as a reminder, do I go to this list? No, I don't anymore, but my staff or seniors probably do when they're, especially a new senior that is filling out this understanding for planning for the first time, they're going to rely on some of these to, you know, make sure they're getting full coverage. So then on page um, 21 is fraud risk factors to consider. So a lot of holding hand on, you know, if you've got good quality control materials. We always read the minutes of the entity to look for what's changed from last year, what's going on with this organization. That's how you know what risk could be occurring. We do a lot of inquiries of management, you know, digging it. Well, what happened this year? It looks like this went up um, versus last year. That, you know, walk me through why that happened. Lots of inquiries. When we do fraud inquiries, we update the internal control understanding and we perform the walkthrough procedures. Your risk is going to increase if something happened in their internal control processes or they don't have a good process in place. So you know you've got some areas of weakness your risks are going to increase. Um, we've prepared, prepared preliminary analytical review. There were some questions on analytical review pro, um, procedures. At the preliminary level, we're really looking at substan or so <laughs> significant changes from one year to the next. And so it's not in as much 
detail. We get more of a big picture analytical review. So you might look at the line items on the balance sheet. Last year compared to this year, what changed significantly? You might look at um, how it's different from what you expect because you read the minutes and it said they had a good year and then revenue's down. What, you know, what's up with that? So you're looking at kind of big picture items in the preliminary analytical review. Um, you're, anytime you do analytical review procedures, you're required to set what your expectations are ahead of time. So you read the minutes, you say, I expect them net profits to be up um, by such amount. They hired three additional staff, so salaries should probably have increased by about 4%. Um, they had a big capital or construction um, project and therefore fixed assets should go up by about 400,000. And then you go look at the numbers and did those things really happen? If they didn't, then you've got some issues, you've got some risk in those areas. So you set your expectations and then um, you compare probably <coughs> current actual to prior year and you might compare to a budget if they, if they adopt budgets. Then we document our risks and um, we calculate our risk of material misstatement. And I provided you with uh, page 26 is where we document our risk assessment form. And actually, if you look at page, let's just go to page 30. Um, for accounts receivable, is this a significant area on the financial statements in this audit it was? Did we identify a risk? Well, we know by standards, there's two risks that always are in place unless you can document your way out of them. You always have a risk of improper revenue recognition. And so on accounts receivable, which is tied to revenue, we have the risk of improper revenue recognition. And we said that risk is on the assertion of rights and obligations. Do they have the right to that accounts receivable? Did they provide the service or whatever? Is that a significant risk or a fraud risk? And we said there could be both. If, for example, there was um, incentive to misstate the financial statements for a bonus arrangement, then it could be fraud if they're increasing their accounts receivable to make their um, bottom you know, look better, their financial results to look better. So that would be financial statement fraud, and that would be a fraud risk. So then, by assertion, then we would um, calculate our inherent risk, IR, and that's just how things are inherently risky. Um, accounts receivable is pretty much anything revenue is inherently riskier. Um, or it could be that it's risky because of valuation. It's very difficult to, um, to value um, the, um, Inve alternative investments, say for example, real estate or something like that. You know, is it inherently risky? And then your control risk is the next column. Control risk is based on their control procedures and then whether you test those procedures or not. So control risk always has to be high unless you test them to make sure that they're, they're in place and they're working appropriately and then you can lower that control risk. And then based on a formula, and, and this is a methodology that PQC uses, other quality control me um, material might use a different methodology. I've seen methodologies that assign percentages instead of high, low, moderate. Um, I see them where it's like inherent is 30%, this is this percent, you know, and then there's a calculation and based on that calculation. So that's really, um, there's examples of methodologies in the standards, but you know, you, if you adopt a quality control material, it's been peer reviewed, you use their methodology this way. Any questions on risk assessment? That was a two second overview. We'll get into way more depth. But I guess I wanted to give you just a feel that it, it, it's, it's real life things, it's not rocket science. Some people said, is there a lot of gut instinct? Yeah. With, with experience, you're going to get, you know, something might jump out of a senior that goes, oh, oh my God, we got a huge issue here. And I can look at it and through other information that I've got, I can go, well, remember, you've got to consider this. 
and my gut says it's, you know, not saying, you know, I could be right 100% of the time, but gut instinct does come into play, and that's why we never have a new staff do risk assessment. It should always be, really, I like it better at the manager or partner level. Partners always should be reviewing this, no matter what. But um, we do lower this to the senior level sometimes, but then with more in-depth review or hand-holding is how you're trained to do it. Um, I'm going to skip this fraud section. I guess the one thing, there was a lot of questions on fraud examinations and forensic accounting, so I just took this right out of our website. Um, all of our CPA, there's, I think there's two ways to become a certified fraud examiner, the certification. Um, and all of ours went through the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners. I think the other way is actually a program through the AICPA, and none of ours chose to do that, and I couldn't tell you why, because I'm not. Kyla Stafford, this beautiful picture right there, she's a partner in our, a shareholder in our um, Bozeman office, and she heads up our CFE department. So what does fraud examinations and forensic accounting look like at Anderson's or Newland? Um, we do prevention services where we can assess the risk for the client, help them build a fraud prevention program in their business. We review internal controls um, to specific operational and policy recommendations. And our team is capable of assisting you in safeguarding your assets. So that's the sale because it's on our website for people looking. But, but um, I have done parts of that. I'm not a CFE, but an auditor, you get really good at internal controls. I've done a lot of um, my staff from probably supervisors on up have done agreed upon procedures on internal controls. We've done um, consulting engagements on helping go through a client's internal controls. Those aren't necessarily when they, ex um, when they uh, are thinking that fraud is involved. It's just to help them put them in place. If fraud is, is um, you know, if they think fraud could be happening, we always get our CFEs involved, basically. Detection services, if you suspect fraud in your organization, our team can help you explore what, whether fraud has occurred. Um, our investigative skills are rooted in extensive experience and a wide range of accounting, auditing, and tax backgrounds. We can help you identify the point of loss, identify potential suspects, um, quantify the losses, and work with attorneys, insurance companies, and other investigators. Um, Kyla worked on a fraud case for a bank up north, a huge one where the FBI came in and she was um, working with the FBI. I mean, it was pretty interesting and exciting, but that doesn't happen very often in Montana. Um, so if you're really interested in just having a career in forensic accounting or fraud examination, you're probably going to have to move outside of Montana. I mean, like I said, we've got six or seven CFEs, so it's part of a career in Montana, but I don't see it being an entire focus. Now, I'm not sure. I think there's more um, police, or like maybe the state, um, you know, maybe more that are hiring that level. That's been an area where a lot of our police departments, sheriff's departments, don't have the expertise, so they've hired outside. But I've heard that more are hiring internally. I don't, again, don't know a lot about that. It's just not my area. Let me see if there's anything else I thought was very, and I'm happy, I put the answers on my notes, I didn't give you, I'm happy to send that to Mike if you're interested in it. He can post it on his website. Most of them, I don't know if they give you any additional, you know. Anything I didn't answer that you just have a, a burning desire. I guess one question a lot was, have I found fraud? Um, I've had two cases of financial statement fraud in my entire career. Um, one was actually on a review where they misstated the financial statements for bonding purposes. They lied. We caught them. We proposed what the adjustment needed to be. They chose not to book the adjustment. We consulted attorney and we withdrew from the engagement. Um, the unfortunate thing with that is we're bound under client confidentiality rules. We knew they just went down the street to a different CPA 
And if they didn't catch it, there was no way for them to know, and we could not say anything. I mean, it, we just had to swallow the big you know, chicken thing in our throat, you know. <laughs> so that was unfortunate. Um, they didn't pay their bill, we turned them over to collection. That was about the most we could do. <laughs> um, we have found misappropriation of assets, nothing at a very significant level. Um, you know, a lot of governments have a lot of decentralized cash collections and we found, you know, embezzlement to the tune of, you know, five to ten thousand dollars, maybe about four times in my career. So, um, it, it, it occurs. Fortunately, none of the clients we've audited have later found significant fraud. I'm not saying it can occur. An audit is not, you know, an audit is to give an opinion on whether the financial statements are accurate um, in all material respects. It's not to give an opinion on fraud. You know, we, do, we have a responsibility for planning our audit to try to find any material fraud but we miss things. The number one way to find fraud is tips. Um, a hotline is very important for large organizations because um, you know, a whistleblower is about the best way. The most, most of the large frauds found in the United States is through whistleblowing or tips from an outside person. So I, I'll email this to Mike if, if anyone wants those answers. I, you know, it's not going to help you pass any test or, or the CPA exam. So <laughs> that's totally up to you. But I hope you got something out of it. I talked really fast. Probably. <laughs> any questions? Oh, okay. Well, thank you very much. Thanks a lot for coming, Stephanie. Yeah, thank you. I'm going to get your five stars. Okay. I'm going to leave these for you. Yes, I appreciate that. You can shred them or whatever you want. I appreciate that. Yeah, if you extend the answers to me, that'd be great. Okay, so no Thank deal. you. Uh -huh. Thank you. Yeah.